Carr uh, from the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development, the Inspection Services Unit. Today is January 19th, uh, 2021. You are here for a presentation on how to prepare for the IOR exam, recertification, and exam process instructions. So um, this will be very informative. We are hoping that you're ready to take notes as throughout the presentation, there's gonna be code references that you might find useful either on how to prepare for the exam or what to expect during the exam. For today's presentation, we do have handouts for you, which you can find under the GoTo panel under the handout section. You'll find that today's presentation has been uploaded for your use. And we've also uploaded some tips from the experts guide for working on projects under OSHRA jurisdiction. That's a, that's a lengthy document, but it provides some good information on how uh, and how to work with Oshbot and what to expect. And it also goes into further detail as to what in the, what the position of an IOR and what you do as an IOR uh, on these projects. We do want to mention to you that there is a deadline to submit the application to participate in the IOR exam, if, if that's something you're looking to do. And that deadline is February, February 1st, 2021. Again, if you're looking to, uh, submit your application to participate in the IOR exam, please submit that to our office by February 1st, 2021, and make sure that you pay your fees as well. Once you pay your fees, Michelle uh, will go ahead and reach out to you and schedule, schedule an appointment for that exam. You are here for a roughly one hour presentation, uh, may, maybe a little shorter, um, and this is a second part in a five part series that helps guide you through the how to prepare for the IOR exam. We will play a recording today, which will announce some previous dates. So be sure that you stay uh, here tuned in until the end of the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we'll go ahead and present those, those future dates for the up and coming webinars as well. You will all be muted during the presentation. At the, at the end of the presentation, if you have a question, go ahead and submit that question to the go to panel questions section. Uh, that you have on your screen. Also, uh, if you feel that uh, one a part of the presentation wasn't clear or you need further uh, clarification, go ahead, type your question into that panel, that same panel throughout the presentation, and we'll answer those questions as we receive them. If at the end you have a specific question if you uh, that wasn't uh, presented on the presentation, go you can go ahead and reach out to us at oshpd.fddisu at oshpod.ca.gov. Again, that's the inspection services unit email, and you can email us at oshpd.fddisu at oshpd.ca.gov. If you experience transmission difficulties, <clears throat> please, be, please go ahead and log off. Log back in using that same link that was sent to you by the GoTo software. And we'll do the same on our end if we experience the same thing. We do want to point out that in our previous webinars, some attendees have had uh, audio issues. And um, we have we want to go ahead and point out that in the GoTo software, there's a section that says audio. If you click that audio, that down arrow, it'll give you at, at the bottom of that portion, where it says speakers, what you have available for your use on your computer. So click that uh, list of values down. And if you have more than one option, click through the different options for audio and that might resolve the issue. So today on today's presentation will be Joe Labrie, Regional Compliance Officer for the Inspection Services Unit here at Oshpod. You'll also hear from Monica Colosi, Compliance Officer from the Inspection Services Unit here at Oshbright as well. And towards the end of the presentation, you're gonna hear from Mr. Dave Carino from the American Construction Inspectors Association or ACIA, which some of you might be familiar with. And Mr. Dave Carino is gonna go ahead and, and share his experiences as to how he went about becoming an IOR, how, what he did to prepare, and more or less pointers as to how to uh, give you uh, maybe the upper hand um, and be better prepared to walk into this exam if you're going to take the exam uh, better prepared. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and click over to the video 
And I'm going to hand over the presentation to Mr. Joe Labrie, which will start off with the introduction. And so all yours. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, glad you could join us. We hope you find this uh, informative. I want to talk about how to prepare for the IOR exam. And uh, we're going to flip through. If I could uh, get this thing to uh, flip, uh, we're going to flip through some slides here. Uh, with starting out with an agenda. Hopefully you guys are seeing that right now. We're going to have an introduction. What's the format of the exam? How do you prepare? What happens after you pass? Who employs the IOR? We're going to talk about some fundamentals regarding the different licenses, and we're going to talk about responsibilities an IOR has. So, so with that being said, we, we get to our first uh, po series of poll questions. And uh, just a reminder, please, uh, please be, please interact with us. We want to know a little, bit, a little bit more about who you are, where you come from, um, what your background is. Um, and uh, with that being said, answer the question uh, as quick as you can. As you know, we only have an hour to to do this uh, presentation. So please, uh, please answer uh, the best you can. We'll go ahead and, and uh, keep the, the polling session to, to uh, as short as possible. Um, I'll try to give everybody a chance to respond. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we'll share the results at the, at the closing of each poll question as well. So it looks like most of you are done answering the poll question. So I'll go ahead and, and close the actual question. And we'll share. The results with you. So, from what you see is um, no, you, um, you've never taken the exam. So that's a good thing. Uh, it's and that's what we're here to do. We're here to explain to you a little bit more of what to expect for, uh, during the exam, how to prepare for the exam, the the format of the actual um, exam itself as well. So. We'll go on to the next question. We want to know what is your background? Is your background in construction? Um, so please go ahead and answer that. And uh, you know, typically, of course, the the amount of IORs that we have <clears throat> and the applications that we have are uh, in the for in construction background, one form or another. Right? It's either you were a uh, city inspector, county inspector for a jurisdiction. Or you may have been a contractor, or you may have been an owner's representative, and that's always um, qualifying. It may be qualifying to qualify for the exam um, here at the through Oshpod Class A, B, or C, depending on what you're looking for. So, as you can see, the majority of you do have construction background. 86% of you said yes. 14% of you said no. And for those that don't have construction background, that's quite all right. If you if you will go over through the minimum qualifications. And and uh, kind of explain that to you a little more. Um, so we'll go on to the next question that we have here. Let me get to that screen. So did you register for all of the IOR uh, webinar sessions? <clears throat> important important for you to know that. Uh, we do have, this is a five-part series, and looking to provide a lot of good information uh, during the this uh, five part. So I'm going to wait for a minute and wait and let everybody answer. And this is great, everybody. Thank you for, for participating in this. It looks like... Um, the majority of you are answering the, uh, the the questions, so thank you so much for this. I'll go ahead and close this question as well, and it looks like yeah, most of you did uh, did register for all of the the sessions, which is which is a great thing because <clears throat> not, today we're presenting how to prepare for the exam. Next, we're going to talk about for the next session, we're going to talk about how to pre uh, how to speak IOR. Session four is going to be how to succeed as an IOR. 
And session five is going to be a summary. So it's it's going to be a this series is uh, we're, we're hoping that it's helpful for you. And then we want to know which IOR certification are you interested in? Are you interested in class A, B, C, or you don't know, which is maybe a no vote. Um, and it's going to be um, either way, we're able to help you. We're able to answer questions for you. And this presentation is, is going to provide a little bit of A information, a little bit of class B information, a little bit of class C information as well. So, um, so again, thank you for, for participating. And let me go ahead and share the results for you. So the majority of you are interested in Class A, which is great. Class A, uh, for those that don't know, is is the the, the highest level of IOR uh, certification where you can inspect uh, on an OSHPOD job all assets or facets of the uh, construction. So, and then we'll go to the last question here. Um, the last question is, we want to know how familiar are you with Oshpod? Do you, did you know about Oshpod before you um, uh, attended the series? Or how, um, just a little bit information for us so we can better gear future presentations for you. <laughs> and I'm seeing that a lot of, some people, you know, not, not so much, not, not familiar with Oshpod, and that's okay. Um, Oshpod, as you go through this series, and you know, hopefully those that are saying not so much, um, you did register for the other webinars, um, which we're going to be able to um, explain to you what you know what it is we do, what what an I what is an IOR responsible for, what are you supposed to do? So, with that being said, that's the last uh, poll question for this series. I'm going to share the results with you, and. As you can see, a lot of you are very familiar. Some are not so much. So um, normal familiar, you know, you may have been involved with uh, an Oshawa project as a, a subcontractor or, or uh, you know, uh, assisting inspections or uh, owner's rep. So um, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close the polling for this session. And we will go on to the next uh, slide. So Joe. Uh, from here, it's uh, all yours. All right, thank you. Um, uh, you know, I appreciate everybody's participation in that. Uh, be sure you click right on the screen for the response to those poll questions, and not in the question box. It's important that we're that we're, we're capturing all of your thoughts. But um, I'm also really encouraged to see the number of people interested in that A exam and that IORA class certification. Uh, we need IORs out there. We need A licensed IORs and, and Bs and Cs also, but um, it, it, I, I'm glad to see that. So let's get into it. Buckle up. Let's go. Uh, what is Oshpod's Inspection Services Unit? I'm just going to do this by orientation. The Inspection Service Unit is responsible for the uh, for the oversight, the the ongoing uh, training and education of both IORs, but also uh, Oshpod field staff. Uh, we're made up currently of six people, architects, structural engineers, inspection folks. Um, all of them are participating on today's um, uh, session, uh, and they're going to help with the answering of questions at the end of this uh, presentation. And how does Oshpod work with the IORs? Well, you know, we do the certification. Uh, we administer the exam. We do the recertification exam. We do the ongoing training and monitoring, and we do corrective measures. So ISU is responsible for that part of it. As difficult as it is, we are asked to identify and work on corrective course corrections on anything we see as being um, problematic or outside of the administrative regulations uh, in the way of a performance of an IOR. How should IORs understand ISU? If, if you take away nothing other than this point right now, it would mean a lot to me. <laughs> And that is, you should look at ISU, the Inspection Services Unit at Oshpod, as a team of people who are there to help you, to support you, to help you be the best IOR that you can be. That's how you should look at it. You should not look at us as the people who are going to come around, you know, spanking people for non-performance. I'm not saying that won't happen, but that's generally who we don't want to be. We want to be there to help support you get where you want to get in your profession 
we need quality assurance people, we need people like you. So let's talk about the exam itself and the sections in the exam. If I can, um, see if I can click through this. Hang on. All right, so it's skipping around a little bit. Okay, so uh, I'm bouncing around a little bit here only because there's a little bit of a lag here that I'm not used to on the transition of the screens. So what's in the exam format for a class A IOR exam? So open book exam. You're gonna need to know about the code and you're gonna need to know about how to read plans. There's 80 questions. You have four answers, to, you have four hours to answer these questions. It's in the morning, it's in the afternoon. Uh, the code knowledge is weighted on administrative regulations and uh, structural discipline. Uh, on the plan reading, it's weighted on the structural discipline. What about the B exam? It's 80 questions to be answered in four, four hours. Code knowledge, right? Code knowledge is 80 questions, four hours. Weighted in administration. The plan reading is also important. 40 questions to be answered in two hours. And it's not weighted on any one discipline. Okay, what about class C? It's open book again. There's no plan reading questions. There's 40 questions, 28 in the administrative regulations, and 20 if you're doing the Anchorage and Bracing specialization. There'll be 20 uh, questions there. They're going to be answered in two hours if you're doing both. And they're evenly weighted on the administrative regulations in Anchorage and Bracing. So let's get some examples of some tests. So here's a test. In accordance with the section of code, who shall submit to the Office of Verified Compliance Report with their signature and based on their own personal knowledge? Is it the architect, engineer, IOR, approved agency, special inspector, contractor, owner, builder, all of the above? How do you find the response to that? First of all, there's a couple things you need to know. First thing you need to do is, is, is get to the right book, right? What book is it? Well, this administrative regulations. And then within the right book, you need to get to the right chapter. Well, what chapter is it? Well, chapter seven is standards, safety standards for hospitals or healthcare facilities. So then you go, okay, good, I'm in the right section. Now what's the or right chapter? Now what section? We're talking about construction. Now you're really just zeroing in, right? And when you get to the right section, you read the section and you look for the types, the types of words that captured, uh, that were captured in the question. And you can find section seven, 151 right there. And the big tip off was we gave it in the question where to look, and that's where you would go, find the answer, it's all of the above. Now, for the purpose of what we're doing here, I, I care, and by the way, these particular questions are not on the exam. These are examples that we've extracted from a pool of questions that we have, um, just to give you a flavor of what to expect. So, uh, here's another question, this is electrical. So right off the bat, there should be a pretty good idea you're gonna be going to the, co the electrical code, but, Utilization equipment weighing not more than blank shall not be permitted to be supported on other boxes or plaster rings that are secured to other boxes, provided the equipment or its supporting yoke is secured to the box with no fewer than two number blank screws. All right, so how do we get to the answer? Again, it's just kind of the same process, right? We want to know, well, what book do we need to be in? Well, that's the CEC. And then what chapter we need to be in? We need to be in chapter three, and then we need to look and study the table of contents. And it'd be really good if you're studying this in advance of ever coming right to the test, is you have some familiarity with the table of contents of the various code books. And then from that section, you're able to extract the answer. You dig in, you have to study a bit on it, you have to search a little bit, search for some of the key words that are included in the question. And you can find that uh, you find that code section that's shown in red right there. That is, is the answer is six pounds and number six screws. Just a couple more, I think. So here's a plumbing question. Test gauges used during pressure testing of plumbing systems shall have a pressure range not exceeding blank the test pressure applied. Okay. All right. And so, same idea, here's the code book, plumbing code, boom, here's the section, or here's the chapter I need to be in, here's the section, and you can see the answer twice. 
And again, plan reading, we start to look at something a little bit different now, right? Now we're not looking at the code, now it's plan reading. What do you need to know? You need to understand some fundamentals about understand, understanding how plans are assembled, how they're put together. Um, this particular example is particularly easy because it's asking in detail 16. So if I'm taking the test, the first place I'm looking is a detail 16. Uh, sell details at openings for openings between 8 foot 3 and 12 feet. Uh, which is the size of the sheet metal screw that you need for that application, 248 or a 10. Then if you look in the drawings and you dig into the details, you can see very clearly on that lower left box in uh, the portion C, that's between 8 foot 3 and 12 foot openings. It requires a number 8 sheet metal screw at 12. All right, more plan reading. A couple more. What did, you know, the, the sample question for plan reading here is that the provided uh, interior elevation, which is the mounting height for the uh, flow 01. So right off the bat, you're looking at the drawing, you're going, okay, where's flow 01? You're looking for that, that item, right? There it is on the right. And then you're saying, okay, what's the dimension? Okay, you see five feet. That looks like a dimension that would apply to the flow 01. The correct answer is five feet. Not terribly difficult, folks, particularly if you have familiarity and understanding how plans are put together. The key is understanding how plans are put together. And if you don't have plans, I suggest get, a, get your hands on some set, sets of plans that you can comb through and get familiar with just the general assembly of these things. I think this is the last question in this, in this group. In a typical uh, operating room ceiling, in which note, there, uh, which of these notes is the information for the LSD02? Uh, so you're looking at the plan and you're saying, okay, I'm looking. And here's, a, I want to make a point. It's real easy to think, okay, what, you know, uh, it's real easy to get uh, bound up and, you know, looking at the detail instead of making sure you really understand the question. It's asking which note. There is a note that you're looking for. You're looking for the identification of a note. And then you dig into the plan and you say, all right, let me find that note because I, that's the answer to the question. And you find that, gee, there's LSD02, looks like it's six, note 6.68. That's where I find the information. That's the answer to the question. So, code knowledge. Let's talk generalities about how to prepare for it. And this is based on feedback we receive from IORs up, across, up and down the state of California. Um, and uh, they have uh, additional things that I just didn't have uh, space to include all of it, but I'll, I'll, I'll read some of these highlights. Uh, high level study of the codes. Gather the applicable codes. Make sure you have the right books. Review the table of contents and familiarize yourself with the different areas of interest. Highlight. Use a highlighter. You know, and get in there the code section. Identify the titles uh, and note the health facilities content in particular. Right. Put tabs in the code books. You know, identify where those sections are that are relative to healthcare facilities. Talk with others who have taken the exam and passed them. Uh, these these folks have, have know what it takes to apply themselves in a way that gets them over the hump and gets this successful result on the exam. Use the TIO template as a guide for important items that you need to know about. And, you know, that's published on the OSHPOD website, easy to access. Most importantly is commit the time and energy to study for the exam every day. It's not going to happen by itself. It took, it's a commitment. Plan reading. Understand the general organizations of plans, like I mentioned before. Before Study the organization, how these plans are assembled. On projects either you worked on, and, you know, if, if you, if, if you uh, don't have some, I'm sure there's folks you know in the industry that might be able to help you with that. Familiarize yourself with the table of contents of, on, the title of, uh, on the title sheet. That's a big deal. Uh, understand the meaning of projects, of the project symbols and abbreviations, and ask questions of other people uh, that on areas of the plan reading that maybe you struggle with, that you know that, gee, I could really get stronger in, say, electrical. Find somebody who's good at that and have them spend some time with you. And then again, commit the time and energy to make it happen. This is actually from the exam itself, so, you know. Uh, Take note, <laughs> uh, you know, know the symbols. Each seat, actually, uh, some of the screenshots you're going to see in the, in the subsequent slides here are actually from the exam. And, and we're showing them to you on purpose. Each sheet has different symbols. You know, the, the cover sheet has different symbols, electrical, plumbing. There's different schedules for different things, right? Understand what those th things are, what they mean, how they're used throughout the drawings. 
know the material designations. And each discipline has different material designations. It's important to get familiar with that. And know the abbreviations, like the previous slide said. And then know the drawing index. This is the actual drawing index from the exam. Know it. Understand, okay, where's the structural? Where are the structural details for, you know, foundations? Understand how you can get that. So you're not spending a lot of the test time digging around trying to meander your way through to the place you need to get. If you can come to the test ready to get where you need to get quickly, the answer will become, uh, it will flow to you a lot faster. So what happens after you pass an exam? First, you get a combined score for code knowledge and plan reading must be greater than 75%. I'm gonna tell you this twice, because there's a reason. 75% is the right answer. Notification of exam results available within four to six weeks from the exam date. If you fail, uh, a failure of, mo of more than one discipline requires a reapplication and exam after six months. Not two months, not one month, after six months, that's when you apply again. And I'm emphasizing that also for a reason. Only one section exam uh, retake is allowed, right? You can't fail two sections and get a retake uh, within two weeks. You have to reapply six months. A retake exam includes the code knowledge and the plan reading. It re, uh, the retake exam is uh, completed within two weeks of the notification and we're flexible. If you're on vacation or a schedule won't allow that, we'll work with you. Uh, review of a completed exams is not allowed. We can't send you the exam so you can have that, but we will show you uh, the example that you see there shows you how you performed on the exam so that you can have a, a sense about where you need to study more. Um, successful examining will be requested to email picture of their official badge once the exam is passed. The badges will be sent out within a couple weeks and the examinees who are successful will be eligible to become IORs on projects immediately and their credentials will immediately be available on OSHPOD website for people looking for uh, IORs. On this one here, who employs the IOR? I want to I want to emphasize who doesn't employ the IOR because you could look at the code and find out who employs the IOR. Who doesn't is the contractor. Who doesn't employ a, a IOR is a manufacturer. Who doesn't employ the IOR is Oshpod. Right? It's important that everybody understand that's the hospitals that are employing the IORs. The different class uh, um, of you know, certifications you can get is the class A, I think, as uh, Caesar mentioned earlier on, may inspect all aspects of the construction. And it's the structural thing that really sets apart the class A inspector. Class B inspector also uh, may inspect a lot. However, they cannot be inspecting the structural work. The administrative part of the regulations is an important part for all classifications. The class C inspector, uh, may inspect one or more areas of construction specialty as certified. We don't test on the certification material itself. We don't dig in on that material like you see on the screen here. Uh, those are those are certifications that you as an inspector would get outside of um, uh, Oshpod's uh, domain or realm and, and you'd come to the exam with one of those already um, uh, under your belt. That's a lot of information, Joe. And, you know, something that we do want to point out um, at, at ISU and at Oshpod is that, you know, it's it's important that you understand that when reading the code, you need to be able to come in and, and differentiate, you know, um, where uh, a sentence begins and where it stops, you know, the commas and the exceptions to be specific when you're reading the code. Um, you know, there is a lot of information. Uh, plan reading, you have to be able to understand and be familiar with the plans and details and notes and footnotes and symbols and there's a lot of good stuff um, uh, that we're trying to, to push and, and and let you understand but I think the most important thing to understand that is that you know when you're out in the field um, as you become familiar and that you're working the field you, you'll you'll you know certain code sections will become ingrained in your mind um, but it's okay it's okay not to know the code in and out. Um, but what is important is to understand how to uh, maneuver and research the code and, and, and be feel comfortable um, 
with the code and knowing where to look. So with that being said, we'll go, we're into our next set of poll questions. Uh, the, the question is, what is the minimum percentage for passing the IOR exam? So again, please feel free to um, uh, provide uh, answers and uh, let us know what it is that uh, you think. And um, Monica, uh, if you're here, could go ahead and Hello, provide everybody. a little more information. So first of all, we want to uh, remember, remind, please answer directly to the quick poll questions, not to the question on uh, on the webinar, because like this, we would like to know exactly uh, how many people really uh, are uh, are answering. So uh, I believe Caesar uh, got the result perfect. Seventy five percent is the ninety nine percent that answer. And actually, it's correct uh, because as uh, uh, Joe uh, provided on his presentation, yes, it's the 75%. As a reminder, the 2019 admin code 7207 section C uh, talks about in order to uh, successfully uh, pass the class A, B, or C uh, certification exam, the candidate must obtain a passing score in each section of the written exam. The prior code was talking about the 75%, the new code doesn't say, but we are still respecting the 75% as a combined score. So thank you, Monica, for that. That's, uh, and I appreciate you giving the code section as well. I know a lot of people um, should, you know, if you're not taking notes, should probably take notes because um, the, the code section we're gonna give you through the answer portion of the poll questions is gonna be helpful for you to go ahead and crack open the, the California Administrative Code um, and uh, research and read the code for yourself and you know hopefully better understand um, the code section. So next question that we'd like to go throw at you is you know the uh, <clears throat> failure of more than one discipline combined requires a uh, uh, reapplication and exam but when when can you reapply? That's the question so please please uh, answer as you see fit. Monica? By clicking, please answer by clicking on the slide, quick poll. If you are on the full screen, probably you have some technical issue to actually click the answer. So try not to have the full screen for the slide. That one, it might, it might help you. So we are waiting for closing the poll. Very good, and thank you for those that are that are participating and uh, providing feedback. This is going to help us again with our future webinars um, and better, so we can better present webinars <clears throat> or present webinars that are better fit to help you out with this process. Um, so I'll go ahead and close the poll question now, and I'll share the answer so everyone can see. Um, Very good. 96% uh, uh, answered as uh, uh, the answer six months, which is correct. And who answered for the four months? Don't be discouraged. The reason why we're having this webinar is exactly to guide you uh, where to look on certain things. And uh, we we want to help. So we we want to uh, guide you in a, in, a, in a way where to look for, for the code. And in this specific question, the code section is the admin code 7209 for the re-examination. Section A refers about the six months after. All right. Uh, the next question we have uh, here, I'll go ahead and hide this and I'll, uh, we only have this one, uh, three more questions left. So we'll go ahead and ask the question, what should you know prior to taking the IOR exam? And this is kind of a tricky question, but you know, we, it all goes back to uh, knowing the knowing how to read the code, um, knowing the code, uh, and where to look is is fundamental. Uh, it's it's important. Um, and 
plan reading <clears throat> when you're in the field is um, just as important um, because the plans are really going to tell you what it is that the DPOR, the Design Professional of Record, is looking for in that specific design and how um, the, the, uh, the whole project in its entirety, how it all kind of works together. Um, you know, if you, if you uh, don't, un don't know, you know, the, the DPOR will go ahead and, you know, submit for approval to OSHPOD for plan review and then go ahead and be reviewed by OSHPOD and then uh, stamp approved. And then after that, it becomes uh, the approved construction documents and those go out into the field and that's what uh, IORs or inspector of records and compliance officers, DSCs or um, district structural engineers and fire life safety officers. That's what we look at when we're out in the field. So I'll go ahead and close the uh, poll and share the results with you. Um, just so you, you can see what everyone else is answering. Very good, 97% code knowledge and plan reading. Uh, just as a reminder, the admin code um, uh, 7207 the portion one talks about class a and class b that both need to have a code knowledge and plan reading uh, and the section two talks about the examination for class c which is only code knowledge but we noticed before the majority of you are applying for class a which this is probably the reason why the majority clicked uh, selected code knowledge and plan reading but also class c uh, even if it's not part of the examination, like even Caesar said, knowing the plans is is not a bad thing. All right. Next question, uh, and we're 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 making good time. So it's uh, the next question is, who employs the IOR? This is uh, something that Joe had mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, and I see that uh, thirty percent, forty percent have you of you have answered. And the majority of you are answering health health healthcare facility owners. Um, so we'll wait a couple more seconds to go ahead and give you the opportunity to answer if you haven't done so already. And I'll go ahead and share the uh, the results with you as soon as we get there. So you know five more five more seconds and and I'll close out the uh, the uh, poll question. So I'm going to go ahead and close it now. I'm going to share the results with you. And we see that 98% uh, of you answered that uh, healthcare facility owners uh, employ the IOR. Which is extremely correct. The admin code 7144 is really uh, defining the healthcare facility owners as who will employ the IOR. Again, it's non OSHPOD, is not the contractor. Yeah, and it's and this is uh, this at times may be uh, a little difficult to understand because you know the IOR is out in the field and you're you're really working you know uh, uh, elbow to elbow with with the contractor and you know the, the even the construction management company and you're you know you're you, you end up having a really good working relationship with them but you know just just be mindful that uh, it's they're not the ones that employ you you're actually as an IOR you're employed by the healthcare facility owner. Um, so, and last question, I'm going to go ahead and hide the, this results. And last question we have during this poll session is, um, can IOR class B inspect and approve structural elements? And this again is something that Joe had mentioned in his presentation. Um, and, you know, for those who are not familiar with OSHPOD, you know, this, this, this may be a little, a little confusing um, because class B, um, can really inspect almost all portions of the project um, except for one. So um, I'll give five more seconds to go ahead and close this poll. And it looks like the majority of you are, are voting. So again, greatly appreciated. This this information is really going to help us uh, as we move down the line with IS2. So I'll go ahead and close the poll now and I'll share the results with you. Perfect. So class B doesn't uh, inspect the structural element. And again, the admin uh, code 7200, section 2, uh, refers to what class B inspector can uh, uh, inspect. And 
structural element is only for class A. And again, if you have questions, ask us. We are here to answer, to help you. Um, we are here for you. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and hide this, and uh, we'll continue with our presentation. So um, Joe, you should have control again. So please, uh, all yours. OK. So we're going to hammer through what the responsibilities of the IOR are. Uh, the responsibility of the inspection resides with the project inspector of record. Oshpod only observes the process, and the IORs are doing the inspection. We're looking for adequate and competent inspection that's gained through continuous and periodic inspection. What's continuous inspection? Complete inspection of every part of the work. Concrete or masonry work, which can be inspected only as it's placed, for example. What's periodic? Periodic inspection means the type of work which can be completed, inspected after the work is installed while the IOR is not present and prior to cover up. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to try to go quickly here because I want to save some time for some questions. Um, I want to work on the direction of the design professional of record. Uh, the IOR is responsible to report inconsistencies on the approved construction documents. The DPR's instructions shall not cause the work to be done not in conformity. That, that, that particular sentence bothers me because of the double negative, but hey, that's just me. All right. What files are on the job site? The approved construction documents, the reports of the test inspections, the TIO program. Got to have that. It's not yours to manage if you're the IOR. I want to make that point. All codes and regulations referenced in the approved construction documents, the specifications, any research reports, manufacturers, installation drawings. Uh, you know, the hour should maintain field records on the construction progress for each day. The daily reports have to include the time of arrival, departure, summary of work in progress, noted deficiencies, date and time, the method of corrections. Um, Let's see, IOR notifications to OSHPOD. When is OSHPOD to be notified by the R? When the IOR, when the work is started or resumed on the project, at least 48 hours in advance of the time when foundation trenches will be completed, 48 hours in advance, the first placing of concrete, and when work has been suspended for a period of more than two weeks. Those are the times we really need you to call, contact us and make us aware of the, of the, uh, of the delay. So what are some success checklist items? Daily reports, test lab qualifications. These are items that you want to have these documents on site for your field staff, the design professional, when they come to the site, want to look at this. You as the inspector should have this organized and the ability to share this with those folks as they come onto the site. Special inspection qualifications, the TIO field maintenance. Obviously, this is done by the design professional of record. Um, for some reason, this transition is kind of slow here, but uh, bear with us. The directive of the change log, right? The design professional needs to keep a change log, needs to keep it current, needs to give it to you as the IOR and keep it on site. Verified compliance re reports maintained by the design professional, but kept on site by the inspector. Submittal, shop drawing log. Maintain, again, these are things that, uh, maintained by the designer, but these are documents that uh, you are being asked to keep on site as well. Approved design documents, including deferred approvals, architect and engineer's rec uh, observation reports when they come out to the job site, an oils list, deviation and discrepancies list. All of these documents should be at the uh, on site in electronic form or paper form at the very least. Um, the general contractor's QC program. Well, yeah, that's something we all want to see, right? That's uh, that's key, right? We and, and we don't always have it, but that's what we, we're looking for. That we hope we're hoping that's there. And if it is there, we want you as IOR to have that on hand. Uh, notice of non-compliance log, special inspector reports, discrepancy and correction uh, reports. Those are all important documents to have on site. Test, report, or test reports distributed to the DPOR, the owner, the IOR, identification of seeming errors, and then uh, witnessing of acceptance, performance, testing. And the, the, the last slide I want to 
emphasize here is if you as an IOR want to become a special inspector for your project or a project, um, it's important that you note that these five things have to be in place. You have to be approved by the designer. You have to have the appropriate knowledge and certification to do special inspection of some whatever it is you're looking at. You have to have the time and the desire for the code section. You have to have the tools necessary to do it, calibrated torque wrench, whatever it is. And the RCO has to be able to approve your workload. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you, Joe, for that. Um, I know that we had shared with you that we're going to have three poll questions, three sessions uh, of poll questions. So we're running short on time. So what we're going to do is we're going to go real quick through the questions. I'm going to go ahead and read the question. And then, Monica, if you could be so kind as to provide the actual answer for this, um, that would be great. So <clears throat> the, the first question is, does the IOR work under the direction of the BPOR? Yes, uh, the admin code 7145.3, section 3, says yes, the IOR should work under the direction of the architect or engineer in responsible charge. Perfect, thank you. And then the uh, second question, does the IOR manage the TIO? Absolutely not. Admin code 7141, the DPOR manages the TIO. But this is an important one, everybody. Just may just keep this in mind. Write that code section down. Um, the the IOR does not manage the TIO, although seven one forty one. Thank you. So <laughs> number three, IOR shall maintain field records of construction progress for each day or any portion of a day that they are present at a job. True or false? Absolutely true. Uh, admin code the seven one forty five portion six. Perfect, thank you. And then question number four, are the verified compliance reports maintained by the IOR? No, like the TIO is the DPOR in charge per admin code 7151G. The IOR keeps them in the field, but doesn't manage them. Perfect, can you give that code section one more time? I think that's, that's very important. 7151G. <clears throat> and then the last question we have here, is what does an IOR have to do if they want to be a special inspector on the job? It needs to be approved by the DPOR, like Joe was referring. There is not uh, a specific code that says that in, because the IOR as an individual can become a, a special inspector. There are different code sections that can direct uh, that the DPOR uh, needs to approve um, the IOR as a special inspector. And this multiple uh, code section are the CBC 1704A.2 as a special inspection and test and 1704A2.1 as a special inspector qualifications. Perfect. Thank you so much. And that is uh, the last portion of our presentation. So right now we want to go ahead and take this time to um, thank Mr. Dave Carina again for, for volunteering or agreeing to help us with this, uh, give us his experience as to what, uh, how the IOR exam was and how what he did to prepare. So uh, Dave, all yours. All right. Um, let's check and see if you can hear me first. Everybody, you can you hear me okay on there, guys? We can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, I was asked what I did to prepare for myself personally. Uh, got a lot of advice from a lot of people. The first thing I did was I joined ACIA, which is the American Construction Inspectors Association. Met a lot of really, really good people that were already DSA, Public Works, uh, and Oshpod inspectors. Um, the experience that I brought to the table was 25 years as a commercial general contractor with base trades of structural steel, concrete, and masonry. Um, I also participated because I wasn't, uh, you know, I had not much experience as an inspector, only as a builder. Uh, so I did participate in a two-year construction technology program in Orange County at Coastline Community College. Um, <clears throat> and that was with the different disciplines, with the MEPs, with the admin code, um, and a lot of the uh, community colleges, uh, not as many offer them, but some do. Uh, study time is got to be the most important part of your preparation. If you're only going to get out of it what you put into it. If you get lazy or if you don't uh, really want it as badly, uh, that's going to be a problem. So you want to make sure that you devote your time to it. I studied myself. I live in Huntington Beach. I went to the main library every night after work. 
uh, during the week for two hours. And on the weekends, I was there Saturday and Sunday for three hours. Sounds like a lot of time, but and it is. But I wanted it pretty bad because this was a big career change for me in my 40s at the time. So I did this for three months. Uh, the uh, well, the uh, way I studied was I brought my old school because I graduated from Long Beach State with a business degree back in 1977, probably before a lot of people's parents uh, actually met her here on the website on the webinar. But uh, the old school uh, consisted of handwriting uh, what I was reading. And um, the reason is, and it still works for a lot of people that I talk to today, is because when you're actually writing things out, you're saying it in your head more than just skimming across with fingers. And sometimes when you're reading uh, a book or something or a magazine, you turn a page and you're like, oh, God, what the heck was that? And you make a reference or something. You go back to look and you can't remember where you did. And during that time, I actually wrote down the entire California Administrative Code, Chapter 7, and also Article 517 of this of the uh, Electrical Code, because those were areas that I decided upon on myself that I was weakest in. Um, also, I became when I became a, a member of ACIA, they actually uh, have what they call the Registered Construction Inspector uh, Certification. Uh, Division 2 is Building Inspector. I also took the exam on that, and it's a long one. It's the same length as the uh, as as the Oshpod uh, A. It's an eight-hour exam. It's on code and plans. Uh, it does ha it doesn't relate at all to Oshpod exactly. A lot of things may be similar as far as plan reading because plan reading is one of the things that I find a lot of people um, need a lot more work on. But because of the preparation I did. Uh, um, in that, I scored a 92% on that. And when I uh, when I did pass my Oshpod the first time, uh, all the hours that I put into it uh, really paid off because I uh, I can't remember the lady that was in charge at the time, but I scored in the high 90s. So I was very fortunate with that. Uh, I pulled a lot of the uh, current Oshpod members of ACIA. And a lot of the uh, you got a lot of feedback as far as people study habits that they're recommending. So one of them is check into your local community college and see which ones that are closest to you that actually still offer construction technology courses, because a lot of them still do. A lot of them focus on inspections. And if you can only do one or two, discover, you know, just uh, find out for yourself which areas that you need the most work on, I would recommend highly take the classes there. Maybe even get the ICC cert when you pass it, just to give yourself that practice mode into the exam. <clears throat> You're only going to get out of it what you put into it. There's no shortcuts to any of this. you got to stay focused on your commitment. So you have to plan for a lot of study hours in this. Myself, personally, I, I probably put in about 10 hours for every hour of the exam. Most people are recommending five to ten hours. I've had a couple of people say one to two hours for every uh, every hour of the exam. But the problem with that is that you're only studying for one week, and it's really gonna you're, you 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 got to have some serious photographic memory for that. Keep your study um, schedule consistent. It's a long term gain for temporary sacrifice. It's a lot of time that you're giving up, but if this is a career change for you, it's extremely important. Um, Put yourself in an area that is conducive to studying, away from the distractions. The library would be the best place once they open up. I realize that a lot of them are closed right now because of the current uh, COVID uh, crisis, but uh, they will be opening up again. Or find yourself a quiet place that has little or no distractions. And don't, don't study on an empty stomach. You can't concentrate when your stomach's growling. So uh, have a meal before you start. Bring your water. Keep yourself hydrated. Turn the phone off. Stay off the internet. Don't get distracted. If you're able to, create your own flashcards. You can just take those with you. Put them. You can scan them and put them on your phone. And, and as you're at work, go out through the day. Just kind of start giving yourself some quizzes. Uh, you could find a study partner or a group. There's going to be a lot of people that you you may know one or two people that are in the same boat as you that aspire to be Oshpod inspectors. Or you can even start your own study group. Uh, also, you can friend an IOR. A lot of you people that are out there wanting to get into this are probably right now special inspectors. 
and you know a lot of IRs that you're working with, and you could possibly get some mentorship from them. I'm personally mentoring two special inspectors right now, and one of them I know is listening because she texted me, and uh, the other one's sitting here in the office with me. And I'm teaching them a lot of the uh, ideas and, and uh, not the ideas, but so much the practices of how to maintain, uh, keep yourself out of trouble. Once you do get your license, maintain uh, strictly to the code and just uh, navigating through the uh, day-to-day um, exercises that you go through or experiences. So one of the things that I would recommend is to join ACIA and take the RCI Division II exam for the uh, building inspection. It's also one of the acceptable prerequisites uh, for your application to Oshkosh. And before we started today, I spoke with the current national president and what they've what they're offering right now. If you go to ACIA.com and if you participate in the RCI exam, they'll give you 25% off and they'll also give you a free year membership. And that's the tips that we've got for you. So thank you. Good luck to everybody. Well, that's the end of the recording. We hope that you've all enjoyed it and, and got some useful information from it. We also hope that you've been taking notes. There's a lot of code sections, as I mentioned earlier, uh, before we started the recording, uh, that you're going to find useful. Um, if not, all of those code sections are found within the California Administrative Code. Um, section of the of the code so if you have more questions or need further clarification on something that we presented or just have a question that you'd like to ask about the IOR career or uh, Oshpod in general feel free to email us at oshpd.fddisu at oshpod.ca.gov again that's oshpd.fddisu at oshpd.ca.gov we want to go ahead and remind you that we did upload the presentation today uh, into the go to uh, handout portion of the that software box there on the right hand side. Uh, we also uploaded the tips from the experts guide for working on projects under Oshpod's jurisdiction for your use. Again, that's a very useful handout, explains a lot of uh, roles and information as to who does what on Oshpod projects under Oshkosh jurisdiction. And as promised earlier today, before we started the recording, uh, for the upcoming dates on the next presentations, uh, we will have session three, how to speak IOR on January 26th. We will have session four, how to succeed as an IOR, February 2nd. And we will have a summary of all, of all four sessions on February 9th, 2021. So, those dates are also on our website at oshpd.ca.gov if you'd like to learn more about it. And again, feel free to email us at the email address that we provided you. Again, this was a recording. Some of the information that you heard uh, as far as dates was, was outdated, but it's all of the information is relevant. So if you have any questions, let us know. And with that being said, until next time, and if you uh, want to learn more, contact us, reach out. Thank you for doing your part in providing access to safe quality healthcare environments. So until next time, stay healthy and stay safe.